everybody. Welcome to Sunnyside Sunday class here. Super Bowl Sunday. We're doing roses. But more importantly, the day before Valentine's. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. A day early. We'll talk about rose bushes. You can get your sweetie a rose bush versus going and getting the, the dozen cut flowers. The rose bush will last forever if you take care of it. So, so we'll see if we get you down here for Valentine's Day. But thanks for joining us. I'm uh, Trevor Cameron, our general manager here. So hi to Nicole. She's back there with the pretty picture behind her, as always. Good Mr. morning. Mr. Smith is in the house again, the Whistling Gardener. So make sure you send him some, some good questions. Keep him on his toes in there. He'll be typing frantically, answering questions on the chat line. So thanks to you for coming. Um, we'll do roses today. You know, a little slideshow. We got plenty of information. It'll be fast and furious like usual. But uh, just remember, this is a really common question I've gotten in the nursery for 30 years you know what could i plant in my yard and sun that will bloom all summer long rose is at the top of the list you know to be honest with you roses will start blooming up here usually about second week of may and if we deadhead them and take care of them and feed them which we'll talk about today you would have flowers all the way through the fall on a rose so that's an easy choice for a, a shrub with a very very long blooming season so we'll talk about all kinds of roses First of all, the handout, hopefully everybody got the handout, access to it, it's on our website. We can email it to you. Um, that'll give you kind of a place to take some notes, you know, kind of follow along with the class. Um, just a reminder, we always record these classes so you can go back and, and look at some pictures or check some of the slides uh, later this afternoon. It will be posted up on our website through the YouTube channel. So that's always an option as well. <coughs> and again, <clears throat> Nicole does a fabulous job here uh, with our marketing. On our website is a great rose page. If you click on that, you can access our rose list of what we carry for 2022. Um, we are selling out of some pretty fast, so don't wait too long. Get down here and do some shopping. But uh, we've got a great selection of roses ready to go, and they are all in, with just a couple of exceptions, which which I'll mention later. Okay, um, you know, kind of as a rose intro, like I mentioned, um, you know, rose has got one of the longest season of blooms, and I'm kind of kind of going to tell you in, in this class here today in the crowd, we probably got two guard, two types of gardeners, the ones uh, that are going to go out there and pick leaves and spray and primp and prune and, and manage, a, you know, a traditional rose garden with hybrid teas and, and fancy schmancy roses. Other ones want the summer color and perhaps don't want as much maintenance or spraying. So I'll bring this up a few times. Be really honest with yourself as a gardener and you choose what you want. Roses is a great way to get fragrance and bloom. Maybe you don't necessarily want to cut roses and bring them into the house. You just want to be out in the summer, enjoy color in the landscape, smell a little fresh rose on the breeze, you know, kind of thing. Great. We can choose some shrub roses or we can go the other direction, uh, maybe a, a, with a little bit more maintenance. All right. So let's show you. We'll get into the slideshow here. Give me one second. So there we go. There's me in case you forgot my name already. But we'll first kind of talk a little bit about, you know, planting rose. So you're coming down here to Sunnyside. You want to grab a new rose to add to your collection or add into the garden. You know, always choose a sunny location. There's no substitute for sunshine with roses. We're not going to have as much luck growing these in shade. We want at least six hours of sunlight. Some folks I'm sure are going to ask, is it afternoon? Is it morning? You know, I see the benefit of both. If we have morning sun, we dry the foliage off in the early when the sun comes up um, and we have uh, maybe a little cleaner plant. Certainly the heat mid part of the day and the afternoon is valuable as well. All day sun would be great. But I think as long as you've got one or the other, you know, a, a good east location where I get sun up to early afternoon, um, or I'm on the, the south or the west side, probably going to avoid the north side, especially around structures. We want to make sure we got good sun. Um, a big key with this is air circulation. And I'll be teaching disease class here in a couple of weeks. Um, we'll talk about some road specific things today, but it's always about sun and air circulation. If I've got air moving through, I've got properly pruned plants, I'm going to have a little less disease anyway. So so look at your roses you're choosing. Look how big they're going to get and space them properly. We don't want to cram too many roses into a small area. Again, they're going to compete against each other and we're going to fight disease with, with the lack of sun and air. Um, you know, I like staggering rose plants. You know, I'm kind of OCD and I'm not going to make a perfectly square pattern in a rose garden. I would rather stagger them kind of in a W. That way, again, air is moving through. 
I can stagger a second row in of lower ones if I want, but maybe don't think of setting them in straight lines, but kind of doing that W pattern. So we've got a little bit more room and a little bit more, a little bit more airflow. You know, drainage is always a huge key. Roses do not want to have wet feet, especially in the winter time. So make sure we get out of that drainage. The roses will have a pretty good root system. I would say you need to get down a couple of feet before we're getting into that hard pan layer in our neck of the woods. Break that up, add some compost, you know, do all the typical things we do. You know, healthy soil means I'm going to have health, happy plants. No different with the rose, of course. So even berming them up a little bit. We're not going to plant a rose on a little ant hill, but if this is my soil grade, even a light little mound, you know, two feet across or so will get that up a little bit and give me a place where I can maybe make a moat around it, focus my fertilizing, and focus my watering to, to keep that plant happy. You know, always dig a, a good sized hole, you know, twice as wide, twice as deep. Roses in, in here, and I'm sure most nurseries are sold in five gallon pots. So, you know, if I dug a you know, 18 inch, two foot wide hole, 18 inch, two foot deep, took my native soil, mixed some compost or a good rose planting mix, one third, two thirds with that, that can be used as my backfill and then I can use some of that good compost as a nice mulch over the top as well, okay? And, I, and I, you know, I, I call it a moat, but whenever I plant anything, you know, I'm gonna make it just a little rim of soil around the perimeter of where I had that hole. And that's a place where I can focus my watering without having it run off and really keep that plant happy this first summer. Down the road, I can slough that little moat off of there, but to start with, that'll really help me the first summer or two as we try to get these plants established. You know, like I mentioned, use a compost or a rose mix, you know, one third to two thirds, a pretty good rule. We don't wanna just pour pure potting soil or rose planting mix in our hole. That rose is gonna love that little nutritious circle and not wanna venture out into your native soil as much. So if we can amend it, versus just adding a whole bag in there, we're gonna have a happier plant long-term. You know, you'll hear me in most classes talk a lot about EB Stone Organics. I think the best organic uh, company here on our West Coast, we get all their fertilizers and soils. Their rose fertilizer is excellent. I've used it for years on roses, perennials. It's got a lot of other uses as well. But say we're planting a new rose, we wanna go about half a cup of that rose food in there about a quarter cup of alfalfa meal is kind of one of those really uh, kind of miracle little amendments that does help roses quite a bit. And then you'll see Epsom salts on that list there. Maybe you're not sure what Epsom salts are, but that magnesium sulfate is all about buds and blooms. And why do I want a rose? I want maximum bud and bloom. So if I use a little bit of that magnesium sulfate in there, a couple tablespoons as part of my fertilizing schedule, that is really going to increase uh, my flower count uh, and, and again, make the rose a little bit happier long term. You know, once you've got it planted, water it in real thoroughly. And again, I would always mulch. I, you know, if you're a bark person, fine. Maybe put a little extra food if you're using bark. But if we're using good compost or something that's just going to add nutrients to the soil as it degrades. And again, keep my rose happy with a little bit, little less watering uh, when it starts out. Now, if we look at you know, kind of down the road, you know, how do we care for our roses? You know, rose bush is a heavy feeder. We want to fertilize the rose regularly. You'll hear me, you know, talk about other trees and shrubs, and we probably do them once, twice a year, maybe three times. You know, the rose is something we want to start now, and we want to get on about a six-week schedule. If you want to, again, maximize your flower fragrance and have a happy rose, a well-fed one is always going to be more resilient to bugs and diseases and all these other issues as well. So get on a six week schedule. You know, we started with the half a cup. When we have an established rose, I'd, I'd bump it up to a cup. You know, we wanna put a cup of that rose food down there, half a cup of alfalfa meal. And again, a little bit of the Epsom salts, if that's something you like too, that will really increase your, your flower count as we go through. As we start to bloom, you know, again, this isn't gonna be till, depends on always what the weather does up here. We're looking fabulous and sunny today. Um, but it's still winter, you know, we're going to be a few months. They haven't even leafed out or started waking up yet, um, usually by early May. Sometimes it's the first week of May. I usually say by Mother's Day, we've got some first roses are starting to kind of bloom here at the nursery and in most folks' landscapes. You know, start deadheading. Once those flowers are done, I want to have another flower as quick as possible when that flower is spent. So whether I cut it and bring it inside or I enjoy it in the landscape and deadhead it once it's spent, 
I always want to cut down to five leaves. If I look at a rose stem, you're going to see little groups of leaflets all up and down. I can go as far as I want down in pruning to keep it a little bit shorter, but I always want to prune right above a set that has five leaves in that group and frankly that is facing the outside of the plant. So I keep my rose growing up this way and not back across itself in the middle. So watch for those five leaves. If you want a quick rebloom, that's going to get it to you the fastest. If we just randomly shear them off, you're going to take much longer, weeks longer to, to get another flower set that way. Okay. You know, and one other tip, you know, as we go through the season, we can't do anything about the rain. You know, I don't mind the rain. Sunday usually rains here quite a bit in the spring. So we want to try to avoid overhead watering. We're not going to walk out and put an umbrella, you know, over our rows here for the first two, three months of the year. But when we start to get dried out and warmed up in the summer, which is rose season, you know, I don't, I don't like running sprinklers on them. I don't want to walk out and, you know, bless my rows by hand watering. I want to go straight to the base thoroughly irrigate it and keep the water off the foliage as much as possible, okay? You know, this time of year right now today, you know, we're a president's week next week and that's kind of my spring kickoff week for roses. We always do this class kind of Valentine's week. By next week, you should be getting your roses here ready for spring. Um, we don't want any foliage left whatsoever. You're gonna walk out there with the naked eye, look at your rose, see some cute little green leaves and think, oh, I'll just leave those alone. We really don't want any foliage left that lasted through the winter um, or has just started out. We want to strip that plant and cut it back to about knee high to get it started out for spring. I don't want the chance of old foliage having black spot mildew. You may not see it with your naked eye, but I can promise you up here, it's probably on there somewhere. And if we can get that removed, and that plant cut back, then we're gonna start off the season clean and have a chance to manage our rows properly here as we go through the growing season, okay? So remember kind of knee high come spring. That's shrubs, not climbers. If I got a climber rose, I want the wood and I'm trying to grow over something. So we're not cutting those back as hard, but just we're talking about shrubs or, or, or specific types of roses. I would always remove any weak, broken, crossing canes we want that kind of that center open with our growth coming out on the outside and i would get rid of anything that's not thicker than a pencil that's usually a pretty good rule as far as looking at the wood and going wow i got all this wood what do i thin out don't be bashful you'd be shocked how far we cut roses back and how far i have done at my house and they always come back a little bit tidier if we can get them cleaned up this time of year so remember this is the time of year we go knee high if you kind of, we do this class one more, one more time in the summer every year when the roses are blooming, but remember in the fall, we want to go kind of hip high. So those are kind of that rule, knee high spring, hip high in the fall. That'll help us so we don't have break, snow damage, kind of manage a little bit before we get into winter. Then we tidy it up again the next February, okay? Now I've had quite a few people actually, always thanks for the emails before the class about questions and how do I do this and what are you going to cover? I just typed a long email to a lady this morning that was asking about transplanting some older established roses from her mother's house to her home now. You know, roses can be transplanted. You've got to do this in the winter. So, I mean, you're approaching the end of your time frame. I would say these got to get moved by March 1st or so. Perhaps you go out, President, you know, this week, next week, President's Week, cut them back, you know, to kind of the knee high level. Now we can uproot that plant, take all the roots you can, all the soil you can and get that successfully moved to a new location as quick as possible. We don't want to dig roses up during the growing season. You're going to have much less chance of that rose surviving long term. So try to get them here uh, while they're dormant pretty quickly. You know, I would start always watching for diseases and insects early. You know, I'm not, maybe me personally is, is worried about bugs, to be honest with you. I think we got a number of organic options and it's easy to find aphids and some of the other common things we see on rose foliage. I'm always worried more about disease in our neck of the woods with the wet weather, with the wind blowing all spring, the rain, the neighbor perhaps that doesn't take care of their roses as much as you. We really got to watch for disease early. If we keep care up on top of this, then, then we're going to be have success. If you don't touch your rose and then you bring a sample of it down to me in July and say, I got black spot all over my foliage, what do I do? You know, A, it's not going to kill the plant necessarily. It doesn't look very good. But, you know, we have to go to a murder, death, kill chemical at that point 
strip our plan and kind of start it over again. So if we can get ahead of this, you're going to have much happier rows, a little less time more often versus trying to fix the problem once we've already, we've already gotten it. So you'll see here in some pictures, I'll show you a number of different options. You know, I don't want to sit here on the soapbox and, and preach organics and this and that. It's really up to you as a gardener how you want to attack uh, the rose issue with disease and insect. But kind of think about your options. You know, to me, you'll see on this slide here, option one, perhaps I get a systemic drench that I can pour around my rows about every six weeks, and that does bug and disease. This is not that garbage granular fertilizer systemic that doesn't do anything for disease. Typical granular row systemic is just about bugs and it, frankly not the best fertilizer. I'm talking about a, a, a drench. It is chemical, non-organic, but that does bug and disease. Then I can apply the proper organic rose food that I want to for a happy rose. So that's option one. Option two, which honestly is what we do here at the nursery, we can't afford to, to sell you roses that have black spot or mildew on them. So I get on a once a month schedule of, playing, of, of spraying with something called Rose Shield. That again is a chemical, non-organic, but it does bug and disease. And if I can get on that schedule here, you know, probably the first spray will be mid-March, early April after they're leafing out. And I get on a once a month, which isn't a, a huge amount, I'm going to, again, keep my plants very, very clean as we go through the season. The last way, is, you know, again, frankly, is the way I go, would be neem oil. You'll see a couple of different neem oil products that I'll show here. Um, that would be the organic way to go. If you really want to non, not use chemical, help the bees out, not take a chance of spraying uh, something with chemical in it, we would go neem oil. And that's something we got to do a little more often. If we keep up on neem oil, this is almost like a preventative. So if I get out there again, maybe it's mid-March or so, and I get on maybe a two-week schedule on a dry day, I've got Nemo on my foliage that again does bug and disease, and I'll have a pretty clean plant without having to go, go the chemical route. So if we look at some of these products that we talked about today, instead of me just kind of holding stuff here in the video, um, I put some pictures of them up so you can see the alfalfa meal, again, from E.B. Stone, that's a great little kind of micronutrient amendment. The good organic rose and flower food, that comes in a four-pound and a big 15-pound bag if you've got a lot of roses. We look at something like the Epsom salts, that's the magnesium sulfate. And one thing I kind of mentioned just as a sidebar is the Sulpo mag. You know, that's not for everybody, but that's got no nitrogen in it. And it tends to be more about the root system and the graft and perhaps fresh canes. So maybe I've got a struggling rose. That might be a good amendment to add to this fertilizer mixture that you could throw, you know, a quarter cup or a half a cup on an older rose down here in spring and maybe one more time in fall that would help the root system and some of those other parts of the, of the rose as well. Oh, there's our rose planting mix. Um, we go through quite a bit of this these days. You know, it's a great potting soil or amendment. And this is kind of a tough one sometimes uh, for some gardeners to, to understand. Amendment is something like the compost on the right. I can't plant my rose in pure compost. I'm not going to have much luck. I can use that to amend my soil and make it much healthier and have a, a nicer rose down the road. The rose planting mix can go both ways. So when I grow roses in pots or I want to plant them in the ground, I can use that as a straight potting soil or an amendment. That's got all the little extra goodies specifically for roses and perennials and, and most flowering plants. But for roses in particular, that would be a great potting soil if you want potted roses at your house or I've dug my big hole and I want to mix some of that in kind of like the compost. Either way, you're doing your rose a, a, a great service. Now, when we talk to sprays, you know, here's some of your options. Again, a systemic chemical would be the drench that I can mix in my watering can, walk out and pour around that rose once every six weeks to manage bug and disease. The shield, rose shield there from Bonite is something I would put in a sprayer, pump up or spray on my hose in and actually apply that to the foliage. And that would again be systemic, soak in and prevent the bug and disease. Or we go the natural route, uh, which I would recommend you try if you haven't. Neem oil is a great product to use. The only thing confusing with neem oil 
is those two bottles are exactly the same thing. And, and we kind of, so our customers, I think, have figured it out around here. But the Rose RX kind of speaks to the Rose Grower. Um, it's exactly the same thing as buying neem oil concentrate. We have both here at the store. Sometimes one is out. We always have one of these two. Either one is exactly the same thing. So whether we buy the labeled neem oil or Rose RX from Bonite is their natural neem oil a product with exactly the same ingredients. Now, if we talk roses, you know, kind of selecting a rose for you as a gardener, this is where we kind of get into the, the be honest with yourself and, 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 and tell yourself what you're going to put in for maintenance as a gardener. You know, every year, the two main rose growers around here, Weeks Roses and Star Roses and Plants, we get a fresh crop every January. So ours came in second week of January, we get bare root, we're able to, to prune them properly, cut the roots back, put them in our good soil, we'll get them fed here pretty quick and then off they go for another season. So fresh crop comes every year, we got one chance at this, which is why I'm always like get down and get the best selection because when we sell out, I'm out until next January again. Um, you know, look at budded versus own root roses. This is a key for some folks that maybe don't live right here in the mild climate of Western Washington. Maybe you're farther up into the mountains here or even east of the mountains. If I have an own root rose, I've got no graft, so I've got a much hardier rose. Some roses you cannot get on own root, I'll be honest. Other ones come both ways. We get all the own root we can because it doesn't change the plant it just makes it hardier. When I kill a rose in the cold winter, it's not the rose itself that perhaps isn't hardy. It's that graft union between the rootstock and the rose we want to grow. That's the part that's weak. So if we watch own root, a little bit more hardy is. The budded stuff is all the grafted. They'll take a cutting of Mr. Lincoln or Double Delight or some of these old classic roses that won't grow on their own root. And that's the way we have to buy them as budded. Maybe we mulch the graft a little bit over the winter, scrape that away in spring. There's a way we can help protect it. But if you're if you're in a colder climate, own root is the way to go. Which honestly brings the next point, why we don't do a lot of tree roses. You know, even in our little mild maritime area, a lot of folks will lose tree roses here in the winter. We got nipped pretty good for a couple weeks after Christmas. If your tree rose was outside and maybe wasn't protected, it's probably going to either have some damage or, or die back again at the graft. If we do a tree rose, now we have a graft on top and on the root system. So we've got two points. Yes, we can help mulch the base graft and protect it. Um, sometimes I've seen people do all kinds of weird things with their top graft on a tree rose. Get old pantyhose, you know, or fabric and kind of weave it in and out of there and try to make yourself a little insulation on that graft might help as well. But just be careful with tree roses. That is one, um, again, that I wouldn't classify as super hardy um, and something you need to keep an eye on in the wintertime. Um, and then again, that last point there, we're going to go through a lot of this, you know, kind of be honest with yourself. We want you to have success as a gardener here at Sunnyside. Nothing's more disappointed than you coming in and buying five or six roses, taking them home, maybe not caring for them properly or feeding them or spraying them or whatever and you think you have a black thumb or can't grow roses. So, so be honest with yourself. If you're not going to put the time in, let's choose a different rose that's at the top of the disease resistance list or a shrub rose or something we don't have to spray that you will have success with. So if we look at the different types you're going to find at a nursery, and I don't want to make this too complicated, but here's kind of the classes of roses that you would find here at Sunnyside. You know, and simply a hybrid tea, to me is always your florist rose. You know, there's a lot of good hybrid teas, probably still the most popular rose uh, for our customers and all kinds of colors and fragrances and on and on. But hybrid tea is always gonna produce a long stem with a nice rose on top that I can cut, bring inside, using a bouquet um, or enjoying the landscape. So always a long stem single. Grandiflora is our exhibition rose. So maybe a little taller rose plant as a general rule long stem, I can cut them, but I'm going to have more than one rose, typically three, sometimes five at the top of that stem. So one opens, you cut it out, another one opens, that kind of thing. Uh, Grandiflora would be another classification. I like Floribundas myself. Um, I'm not as much interested in cutting them to bring them in. I want to enjoy fragrance and color out in the yard all summer. 
So Floribundas are going to be our bushier, perhaps a little lower roses, or I'm going to have the big bouquets on it, not a long stem, but a shorter stem with large clusters of flowers. Uh, we carry a large number of Floribundas here as well. Climbing roses, obviously something I want to grow up on a structure. The rose is not going to attach itself to wood like clematis or another vine. We need to attach it to an arbor, a trellis, a pergola, a fence, whatever it is in a sunny location and allow that rose to develop structure with time. We're not going to cut those back as much. We want to, we want to leave the wood. But climbers are something we want to maybe go vertical and get some height and some fragrance and flower out of versus staying a little bit lower in the landscape. Ground cover roses, again, are some of my favorites because they're really easy to grow. There are some good options that are really good disease resistant. And I just want color. I've got a sunny area, you know, that's open. I want color in the summer. You know, plant some roses out there. Let them grow together and make a mass of color. You know, usually ground cover roses are going to stay in that two, maybe three foot size. I can prune them down hard to keep them even smaller every year, but we're going to be much lower and spreading in style. And again, depending on the variety, the fragrance, the color, the style that I want. At Sunnyside, you know, for us, we've got three main groups of ground cover roses. Um, Happy Trails, we can all sing the song here. There's four colors of that now. We got sunshine, sunset. Uh, there's there's a bunch of them. You'll see four different colors back there. Uh, drift is one that's out of star roses. Those we don't do bare roots, so that's one of those things that will be here a little bit later in spring. There's a lot of color options as that as well. And then flower carpet is a series we bring in from Monrovia. They've been around forever. Not super fragrant on those, but we can get the colors we want. Again, the whites, the reds, the pinks. Uh, different shades all the way towards an amber, kind of a yellowy orange color as well. Um, David Austin roses are back for 2022. We've had a couple years where, uh, unfortunately, David Austin sold out on their website during the pandemic. It kind of went mail order only. The nurseries have them back now available for retail customers to come purchase. So we've got a pretty good chunk, a couple hundred David Austin roses back there. If you want to go for fragrance, fragrance, and more fragrance, you know, Austin roses always kind of make me chuckle when we see the, you know, apple with the hint of pear, you know, or frankincense with the touch of myrrh, you know, they've always got the fancy fragrances on the Austin roses. So there's some fabulous colors and exquisite fragrances if you want to kind of enchant yourself uh, with an old traditional uh, English type rose. Shrub roses are the last one, you know, and that's one we don't want to forget about last. But, you know, this is kind of where I'm at in life. You know, I used to have the hyper teas and these roses and I had time. Then I got married at 40 and have a couple young boys. I don't have as much time to take care of a formal rose garden. So I have a lot of shrub roses at the moment. These are ones I get color on. Yes, fragrance on some, other ones not so much. But I don't have to spray or do the fine pruning and maintenance on nearly as much as I do on a lot of the hybrid type roses. So look at shrub roses. And particularly rugosas, we'll see some pictures of them here in a minute. But rugosa rose will give me that big rose hip, which is awful pretty in the fall and the spring. Very intense, old, spicy fragrance. And these, I kind of chuckle. Like if you live up here, you know, I'm an Everett resident close by here. And the city cities will use a lot of rugosa roses as mass planting. This is something they'll run a lawnmower over, you know, down on our waterfront in Everett coming out of winter. They're pruned down to six inches and guess what? Off they come again and here we go for another summer uh, full of flower and fragrance. And those we cannot spray. I wanna make sure that clear. If you have a rugosa rose, we are applying no chemicals to it whatsoever. If I spray a rugosa with a systemic, I will burn that plant. So this is one you don't have to spray. I can check it with neem oil, get a little bit of aphids here and there, but you're not gonna fight the black spot, the mildew, and some of the typical uh, foliage issues that you do on, on hybrid type roses. So there it is, you know, be honest with yourself. Are you going to spray? If you were here, I'd make everybody kind of raise their hand. Like, yes, I will try. You know, be honest with yourself. Are you gonna spray? Are you gonna deadhead? Do you want cut flowers, fragrance? Do you just want summer color? You know, that is something I would think about before I came down and purchased a rose or come talk to me or the staff and we'll help you choose. 
you know, be honest with yourself as a gardener. You're going to get what time you put into it out of it. If you're not going to spend a lot of time, you know, we feed them, we prune them. Do we want to spray or not spray? And how involved do we want to get? So kind of ask yourself those questions here in the class. And then again, I think you're going to have great success as you choose some good roses for you as a gardener in your own landscape. There's no better blooming shrub for the sun. I'm going to tell you right now, again, a lot of people come down and want, we used to call it the wonder shrub. You know, I want something that blooms 12 months of the year. I never have to touch. It's evergreen on and on and on. It doesn't exist. <laughs> the wonder shrub is a mythical creature. We want rose is something that we can have bloom May all the way through the fall and enjoy the color. on. So if we start looking at some specific roses here, I'm going to whip through these pretty quick. Um, just to kind of pick out a few, if you, again, you look on our website, uh, you're going to see a massive rose list that Nicole and I produce every year. It's got everything we start the season with, colors, fragrances, disease resistant, all that stuff you need to know. Um, these are a few that I pick out and I try to mix it up a little bit every year, um, show you maybe some options you've got out there. So again, hybrid tea is our long stem, single bloom. Fragrance is going to vary by variety. All the tags will tell you that here as you shop. Um, but certainly some to consider. Perfume Factory, I'm guessing you can uh, can probably figure out that one smells really good. That's a nice heavy fragrance one, a little bit newer, just came out last year. We had great luck with it. It's a little bit different color too. Uh, All My Loving, another fabulous fragrant kind of pinkish color. Uh, if you like the, the BBC, the old Downton Abbey series, they've got a number of great roses that have come out of that series as kind of a sponsorship. Pretty Lady, I can't say it much with an English accent, but Pretty Lady is one uh, one of your options. And again, I think a really unusual color. Uh, Love at First Sight is a great red, but if you don't want the solid red, look at the kind of cream color that's mixed into the center of that thing. A lot of the great new roses are kind of mixing the two colors together in something like Love at First Sight. A painted porcelain just came out last year, and I thought that was a really interesting color where it's kind of that silvery pink. We got a little different tone on that. If I looked at the top of it, it looks pink. If I look from the side, it looks kind of more silvery cream color. Um, very cool color, and, and again, a, a good fragrance on that as well. Lots of good red options for hybrid teas. You know, we've got old school Mr. Lincoln and a few others around. Veterans Honor, um, I like for a red, I think maybe that and Firefighter are probably a little more disease resistant if you want to get a big red classic, you know, cutting rose for hybrid tea. Um, and we've got plenty of both of those around. And if we go yellow, that's my favorite color of rose. So I had to put old Henry Fonda in here. We've got some good yellows around. Um, and again, white, you know, I'll be honest, probably five years ago, nobody seemed to like white blooming anything. And now everybody likes white blooming anything. So look at your white options. There's some great white roses out there. Again, if I want to maximize fragrance, disease resistance, and ease to grow, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do hybrid tea, I'm going straight for Sugar Moon. That is one we get ten times more than any other white, and I think that's the best white hybrid tea on the market. Uh, another couple, Francis Meeland is an old school pink. Um, that's going to be at the top of the fragrance list. So if I'm going for cut pink, fragrant, like fill your nose with old rose fragrance. Francis Meelan will be towards the top of my list for pink. Um, and good as gold, I always put in here because I think it's a little different color. It's not yellow. It's not orange. It's kind of gold. It's kind of that brighter color in there. And I think that's another one that's been, been pretty popular here the last few years. Just Joey would be the one I'd go for straight for apricot. That's the best Pacific Northwest or uh, hybrid tea in that color palette. So just Joey, we get a bunch of, and you remember we were looking at kind of love at first sight where we had the color in the center. This would be the, the Piketty style rose, something like Pinkerbell. It's got a terrible name, sorry, but but uh, we get quite a few of these Piketty roses in. So I want one base color. It's almost like I took a little paint brush, you know, and kind of edged the petals in a second color. Very striking on the rose garden for sure. Now, our second group we talked about was Grand Flores, And again, maybe just a little taller than the typical hybrid tea. Um, again, we pick our variety for fragrance, for color, uh, and disease resistant. But we do get a, a, a pretty good chunk of Grand Flores in as well. 
Um, if I was going to tell you one, that twilight zone, I always put first. Um, not a lot of purple roses out there. That's got intense old rose garden fragrance. Um, that is one of the most popular ones here on the property. We got like 50 of them this year. We probably still got 30 here after a month. So that's one if you want to get down here early. I don't know that we ever have any left by May to actually watch flower here at the nursery, but but uh, that's a great dark purple one if you want something kind of fun. And Twilight Zone's a great name. Uh, Sweet Spirit would be another great little tall uh, grandiflora. Uh, you can see again, kind of mixing these colors together. Parade Day will give me that kind of variegated flower with the light pink and the cream. That's another outstanding one we've got in stock. I call this the Sandra Bullock Rose, but Miss Congeniality, if you ever see that movie. That's another one where we kind of do that pickety flower. So I've got that base color, and then someone's taking that nice paintbrush and kind of uh, kind of spruced it up a little bit with that second tone on there. Uh, Sitting Pretty was a new one again last year. Kind of looks a little like Ragosa Rose and certainly smelt like it. That was another old, really good old garden spicy rose fragrance on Sitting Pretty. Uh, Anna's Promise is kind of that coppery apricot look. That's a tall one that would give you that color. That's another one out of that Downton Abbey BBC series. Uh, Coretta Scott King, you know, Martin Luther King's wife. That's a great coral with the white center, kind of that bicolor. That's one that's a very striking uh, color in the landscape as well. I always got to put a yellow one in each one. Happy Go Lucky would be the best tall yellow grandiflora. We've got some of those here as well in 2022. Now, like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I've, I've kind of always been drawn to floribundas. I don't have problems with the rest of the roses. It's just this one for me. I want color. I don't want to cut them as much. I just want color in the landscape and smell on many of them as well. There's a lot of good floribunda options, maybe down growing more like four feet tall, so a little more manageable. Um, here's a few of the kind of unique colors. Arctic blue was new here a few years ago. Probably the bluest lavender rose we have, um, if you like that color. Uh, Burst of joy, if you like the orangey yellow, that's got a great two-tone look to it. A celestial night is very plum, getting towards purple. That was another new one here a few years ago. Uh, Cinco de Mayo just sounds fun. I'm sorry, that one always has got a kaleidoscope of colors. That one, if you had Cinco de Mayo, you would probably see the the pinky, orangey, yellow kind of all blending together. As those flowers age, a lot of these floribundas will also change color. So this one is a great one if you like kind of more than one color. Uh, the Iconic series is, is kind of fun to me. It's growing on me. That was one when it came out maybe four or five years ago. I was like, I don't know if I really like that. Um, but we're kind of, they're kind of growing on us and the customers have liked them around here. Very different where I've got a big rose, but I've always got that bullseye kind of center with a different color. So we've got Iconic Lemonade, Mango Lemonade, Plum, a bunch of different options out there where you'll see, you know, kind of that bullseye center color on a rose is kind of fun too. Um, again, if you like yellow, I like, there's two yellows right there. Um, you like yellow and you want minimal care, you know, I would probably put Julia Childs at the top of the list on a non-shrub rose for a floribunda or any of the other classes. You know, this is one I don't think you'll have to spray much. It's got great fragrance. Uh, Julia Child comes own root as well. It's another benefit. Uh, that's one that's probably towards the top of the indestructible list. If you like yellow, a little bit of pink in there too. Um, that would certainly be one I would consider. Uh, last year, Life of the Party came out. You know, again, kind of opens yellow, get the pink in there as the flower ages. You get a great picture where you can kind of see both, one that's been open for a few days and a fresh one, they're bright yellow just opening. To me, it kind of looked like the peace, the peace row, little peace rose colors, but in a floribunda, you know, so something a little, again, bushier, a little bit lower. Uh, lavender and blue have always been the mythical colors up here uh, we, we struggle with in our cooler, wet weather. Um, I've tried a lot of different lavender roses over the years. We would never get in Blue Girl or Sterling Silver or some of these other ones, Lagerfeld, that just struggle up here with disease. Love songs about as clean as I've seen. I mean, a little bit of spraying, yes, 
But if I want a lavender rose, I think Love Song would be the first one I'd point you to. Um, that's a great grower and, and one, again, that we tend to get a little bit more of. Uh, Queen of Elegance, again, on the newer side, very interesting color. And then we've got old Rosie the Riveter. That's another one that kind of speaks to a lot of people. If you like the orangey, you know, kind of sunset shades, uh, Rosie's a great rose that is, again, a little bit like Julia Child, pretty good on the indestructible side for a, for a Floribunda. Now, Sunsprite is my all-time favorite. It's the first one to bloom around here. It's yellow. It smells great. It's got great foliage. But this one, we will have to spray a little bit. I don't want you to think this is on the top of the disease-resistant list. We get a bunch of them because they're popular. We do. I would definitely recommend spraying them a bit. Uh, to keep them clean but if i want the earliest yellow bloomer sun sprite would be at definitely at the top of the list for that uh, pumpkin patch if you like orange that's a really striking uh, orange variety of floribunda now a couple climbers you know if you want to kind of mix it up i don't know what it is the last couple of years climbing roses have gone through the roof we're already out of a couple uh, we got more in than last year uh, we'll probably get more again in 2023 but everybody seems to be doing climbing roses, which is great. You know, if you've got a sunny spot, you want some verticality with the rose, that's a, that's a great option in the home landscape. Uh, there's some really fun uh, climbing roses. I put a few on here. We've got pretty much all the colors around still. But a few like Fourth of July, very interesting, you know, kind of multicolored flowers. Joseph's coat, same way. You can see from that picture, lots of different shades as those flowers age. You know, if I want to go kind of to that quartered, old school kind of English rose look, any of the Eden series, white Eden, pink Eden, pink and pretty Eden, there's a whole bunch of them that we carry here. Those are always great choices to grow on an arbor or structure. If we go old school, <coughs> excuse me, like Don Juan, you know, that's our old super fragrant red climber. We get a couple reds, but if I'm going for smell, I'm going straight for Don Juan. Purple splash, very different, again, with that variegated flower, purple with white, some yellow in the middle. And Golden Opportunity is a newer one, last couple of years. Or again, I'm on that orangey or apricot side of yellow. That's another very striking uh, climbing rose. <coughs> now, we look at shrub roses here. You know, again, we're getting towards that side of the rose choices where I probably don't have to worry as much about deadheading, spraying. I still want to feed them. I still want sun. I want all the rest of those, but I can probably be a little safer as far as disease resistance. These are, again, kind of those iconic. We looked at a Floribunda where I've got that bullseye rose. Very different look. <clears throat> In your eyes, if you like old 80s music, I call that the Peter Gabriel rose because that's the old Peter Gabriel song. Easy on the eyes is another option for that. We looked at Ragosa roses. And again, if you remember me mentioning, these are the ones I could probably indiscriminately hack off down to whatever height I want. They always grow. These are ones we do not spray here at Sunnyside. And you should not spray in your yard. But this is one that I want to naturalize. If I plant a Ragosa in a spot, it's going to sucker off the root system <coughs> and naturalize in an area. So this is a rose that I can plant out in the garden, in the sun, even on the curbside, the, the roadside, out somewhere where I want color all summer, but I'm not going to have to go out and mess with it as much. So this is one we would also get the large hips as well. So Rago Rosa Ragosa and Ragosa Alba will give me my two upright plants. I've had these in eastern Washington in gardens, and these are plants that would get large with age. I can prune them if I want, but you could almost create a, you know, a six-foot hedge that's covered in thorns to keep some things out of your yard with the Ragosa rose. These will be the tall options. If we looked at more spreading type Ragosas or hybrids, we can look at purple pavement, snow pavement, raspberry rugo star. We got a whole bunch of options for those around where I would have something more like three or four feet tall that would still spread, but I'm not going to have quite as much height. And we've got some hybrid ragosas like Hansa, Linda Campbell's a good red, 
We've got Therese Bugnay. We've got a whole bunch of options, on, again, for hybrid type rugosas that would be clean foliage, heavy fragrance on most of them, and, and a little, again, a little bit less, less maintenance. <clears throat> I think the last one here is the ground cover. So here's a few that I mentioned at the beginning. Sunshine Happy Trails, Rainbow Happy Trails, Playful Happy Trails, and Sunset Happy Trails. There, I can say Happy Trails again. So this is one, we got a few color options. And I don't want height. I'll be honest, a lot of these don't have heavy fragrance, but I want color. I want to look out along my border in my sunny garden, and I want to see flowers all summer long. I don't have to deadhead these. <coughs> I keep them fed. Yes, I watch for a little bit of bugs, some disease here and there, minimal spraying, but I want color. I'm not going for fragrance as much. Those would all be great choices. So I kind of for space eaters. And then the same with the drift. There's a couple color options. Lemon and coral tend to be the two favorite ones here, but we would have whites, reds, and a few shades of pinks. A number of different options on the drift series as well. And then flower carpet, you know, amber and scarlet are the two most popular here every year, but we do have white, a couple different shades of pink, uh, some different options as well. So amber is the only one in this series you will get a light fragrance with, but I kind of put a landscape picture in there because that is what I'm talking about with that scarlet rose. You know, we planted two or three of those in a sunny border, allowed them to establish. They're not overpowering my garden, my lawn, but I can look out there June all the way through the fall and see color. You know, that's a great example of a rose I want flower color on. Don't necessarily care how much it smells. Oh, that last one here is English rose. So you can look up, you know, the David Austin roses here, you know, come with the hugest picture tags, very descriptive on fragrance and all that. You're welcome to kind of shop those. I, I just put a few other roses in um, that we would kind of think of as English rose. If you look at that classic, you know, kind of cabbage quartered rose look, that's what all these would exhibit, like David Austin's, uh, maybe a little bit less expensive, a few dollars less for some of the other hybrids, but give you that same look. So uh, all dressed up. The GR means that's a grandiflora. Fun in the sun, same thing. That's a tall grandiflora. State of grace, same idea. You've got a great hybrid tea like Delish. You know, that's a super fragrant pink that would give me more of a hybrid tea. Edith Darling is another one, you know, kind of out of that BBC Downton Abbey collection. That's actually a shrub rose that doesn't get very big. That's a great option for a small spot in the sun or even a container rose. That's a great choice to grow as kind of a container rose as well. Sweet Mademoiselle. And the last thing here we got is the new for 2022. So I think it's pretty cool at Sunnyside. I did this at the previous nursery I was at as well for a long time, but we get roses in a year ahead of time. So we'll get demo roses. I don't even know the name of them until the summer, until they tell me, but we'll get roses in but we'll put in pots, I hide them out back. You guys will never see them here. We feed them, but we don't spray them because I want to see how they do sitting out here in typical gardener's yard. They feed them, they water them, maybe not as regular on the spring. So we want to see how, how good they are. Do they get black spot? Do they get mildew? Do they bloom nicely? And then we can evaluate them and decide, you know what? That is one we'd like to add to our inventory for the next season. So last year we did the same thing. These four were the winners. We added these four into our mix uh, for 2022. So Chantilly Cream, uh, to me, is a little different color. That's a great hybrid tea, good fragrance, but a much lighter yellow, kind of that creamy yellow. Um, and I, it's been a popular one already. I had three or four people come yesterday alone asking for that one in particular. Uh, Pop Art, if you like some funky, fun roses, uh, that's a funky, fun New Granda Flora. That one's got some sweet colors going. You can see that kind of English rose look again with the quartered center, but I'm going to have that variegated yellow with pink look uh, when I do pop art. That's a tall grandiflora. Then we've got a couple new florabundas, uh, Forever Amber. Again, that kind of that quartered English rose look, decent fragrance. That's a great color kind of on that gold side of yellow. And then again, everybody, all the breeders are going for more bluey, lavender-y, purpley plum color, because that's the one we don't have as many options on. Sweet Madam Blue is the new new uh, Floribunda from Weeks. 
uh, that would have those colors going as well. We've, we've got a nice chunk of those in here in stock. So there's our slide. Oh, I did pretty good in the call. I made it in 50 minutes. So there's our, our slide at the end there. You've got our website on there. Again, you can access a lot of this information on our web. Um, and you've got a way to, to email us as well. If you've got questions, pictures, we're always here and we're always happy to help on email, bring a sample down, bring a picture down, come down and we can chat roses anytime with me or a lot of our qualified staff. Let me stop the share here. There we go, that works. I went in the corner today so the sun wasn't glaring in my eyes. It's actually worked out a little better. Um, so if we just tidy up here, we'll do some questions. I bet you Steve probably got them all, but we'll do some questions here in a second. Um, you know, just as a reminder for all the classes, you know, I think it's a great thing Sunnyside does. We hopefully teach you a few things. We come down here, do some shopping. We want to sell you success. Yes, we're trying to increase our bottom line, of course. But if you take a rose home, you should have the sprays, the proper foods, the things that go with it. And then you're going to have success as a gardener as well. So we put on sale today. It starts today all the way through Friday. you got 20% off every rose on the property. And the E.B. Stone rose and flower food, the best rose food I've used. You've got that in the pouches, or if you, again, you've got a few roses, get a 15 pounder and, and hoard it in the garage and you'll have your rose food for the whole year and even going into 2023. So we've got that on 20% off as well. So take advantage of the sales. Like I mentioned early, you know, our rose sales right now are up double and we're in the dead of winter and they've only been here in less than a month. So we're up double right now in rose sales and we only get X amount. This is it for the year. So besides those couple of things I mentioned, flower, carpet, and drift, we'll also have some tree roses in a little bit later um, as we get towards summer. Besides those things, you've got maximum selection of everything. Get down here, shop early, get the one you want, and then you'll be happy here as you go home and plant it, okay? The one, the one bit of bad news I'll pass on in case you're looking for it. I don't know why I haven't got a straight answer from any of our growers, but we have zero double delight this year. And I have a feeling most nurseries are going to be in the same boat. There was nothing. They had crop failure. Something happened. Double delights, honestly, not the best rose to grow around here anyway. But it's a popular one, an old school rose from, you know, 50 years ago. We just don't have any double delight. We'll be back in 2023. Um, but that one is not in stock for this season. We took it off of our list for, for 2022. Um, just a real quick. You know, next will be take a week off next week. And in two weeks, I'll be back uh, doing the live thing here for classes for two classes that weekend. So Saturday, the 26th is always a must watch spring lawn care. We'll go through everything on how to rejuvenate that turf going out of wintertime. Kill the moth, get the weeds, get the seed down, do all the fun things. So we've got brand new turf heading into spring and summer. And on the 27th, is a specific insect and disease class. So if you wanna geek out with me, you know, for 45 minutes that morning, we're gonna talk a lot about the common issues that we would see in all different classifications of plants. Not one specific topic, but fruit, berries, rows, everything down the line. We'll talk about the most common things I see come in uh, to the nursery here as samples or emails and how we would correct those issues and, and frankly get ahead of them before they happen, okay? So there's information overload in 54 minutes, Nicole. Let's see what we got left for questions. Um, there's been a good selection of questions and Steve has gotten most of them. So uh, unless there's anything that you all haven't uh, asked or that you haven't heard that you wanna know, throw it in the chat real quick. Um, and as always, we're here you know, on email and, and phone. So if something pops up after we end today, you can always still get a hold of us and we're happy to, to answer those questions for you. Um, I love these talks, Trevor. It feels like you know this growing roses is kind of something that is a little daunting and you make it a lot more uh, relatable and less scary and Something that it feels like we can go out and do ourselves. So I really appreciate the step by step. And um, you know, everybody's asking about the slides. We don't make those available on their own, but they are part of the recorded class. So you can still go back and pause it and get all that information that you need. You know, even print a uh, screen, like take a screenshot of your screen if you want to print something and take it home with you. But um, they're always available on the on the videos, and it's good to go back because sometimes it's a lot of information to take in at once. So um, we appreciate you joining us today. There's no questions that have really popped up so if anything comes up thank later, you, Steve. reach out to us yeah thank you whistling garter um so we hope to see you again for the next class thanks for joining us today yeah thanks everybody the sun is out again we'll hope to see you up in the nursery it was busy yesterday it will be even busier today
And happy Super Bowl Sunday. I'd say go Bengals, but I hope I won't offend anybody from L.A. So I'll, I'll root for the Bengals, though. But uh, enjoy the game.